You know, we talk a lot about fandom on this channel and, you know, all its weird minutiae and influences and all the little petty dramas that go on. We have fun, I like to think, and I hope that people come away with having learned something new, because I personally believe that fandom has value and it is worth discussing seriously. And sometimes a fandom is so big that it is a momentous task to even try and tackle it as a topic. That's the kind of fandom we're talking about today. That's right, we're here to talk about Supernatural. Supernatural is a fantasy action show from the CW about brothers Sam and Dean Winchester, played by actors Jensen Ackles and Jared Padalecki, who travel the country fighting monsters and defeating the many forces of evil which threaten the world. Throughout, they encounter vampires, ghosts, demons, and so many more creatures of the night. I think in the show they're called Hunters and maybe work for the FBI. I only watched a few episodes of the show for research purposes, but there was just so much fandom stuff to sort through. There was just not enough time. And also, this show lasted for 15 seasons, and I have a finite amount of time on this earth, you guys. <laughs> also, learning plot threads secondhand through research was kind of more fun. Anyways, the show was created by Eric Kripke, who supposedly had been thinking about the show for 10 years before it went into production, so he had this idea at some point in the 90s, even though it took a while for it to get made. And while I think in some ways the show on paper sounds kind of generic, I think it also sounds potentially really interesting as well. It's got kind of like a Monster of the Week meets the 1960s travel drama Route 66 vibe going on to it. In its early days, the show was very well received. Even to this day, general consensus is that the first five-ish seasons are pretty solid and are worth watching, and it just kind of takes a nosedive after that. Anyways, like any popular show, especially for whatever reason popular genre fiction shows, it eventually garnered a very big online fan base. I should mention though that despite the early days of the show being considered its best, it was not without controversy. A lot of talk was had about the show's treatment of female characters even way early on into its run, and that was a critique that I think lasted well into its final season. Female love interests would oftentimes just show up for a few episodes and then be killed off or just vanish. It also made writing fanfiction kinda hard, because there were no, like, OTPs to root for. The best and strongest relationship on the show was between the two brothers themselves. And that gave a lot of fanfiction writers an idea of how to get around this little problem. Their solution caused an insane amount of controversy and continues to do so to this day. Seeing that the only solid and strong relationship on the show was between the two brothers, fanfic writers decided to write fanfiction about the two brothers together in relationships. Sometimes in these fics they are explicitly still related, sometimes it's an AU where they're not but they have a similar dynamic. It really does vary, but the term for this kind of story became Wincest, named after their last name, Winchester. To be perfectly honest, this does not actually surprise me that much. There's this theory I've heard that fandoms ship characters based on the chemistry between them as opposed to what their actual relationship is like. For example, it's arguably very weird to ship Draco Malfoy, an anti-muggle-born wizard bigot, with Hermione Granger, a muggle-born wizard, but the relationship between the two can be easily extrapolated into many ship dynamics that people love to write, like enemies to lovers, even if that's not really what's going on in the original text. All that vitriol between the two of them can be reinterpreted as tension, and then voila, you have a romance. Some people get really angry about this kind of fic, even to this day. Like, they think that shipping two brothers together is weird and gross and nasty, and it's a whole big discussion, and I don't want to get into it in detail, but personally, I don't care. <laughs> Look, I'm not gonna say that I read this kind of stuff, I don't, but like, I am in no place to judge. One of my favorite anime of all time is Uran High School Host Club, which has these two twin brothers who are constantly implied to be fucking, and they keep having lines like this. How come this stupid script portrays Kaoru as the pitcher? Yeah. And I watch it, even to this day. Also, I've read, like, Anne Rice's Mayfair Witches, which is just incest all the way down. Like, the Mayfair Witch family is actually grotesquely inbred. I've also read the Song of Ice and Fire books, and I'm not saying that I actively look for this kind of content, but I am saying that I've engaged with it, and I think people who freak out because someone wants to explore a taboo subject are kind of weak. Like, you can't just not read it. I think there are lines that should not be crossed, 
but that's very much a thick by thick basis kind of thing, in my opinion. Whilst there are certainly topics I don't think should be explored in fan fiction, or I think should be handled delicately if they are, it's the kind of thing where I want to approach it on a case by case basis, as I've said, as opposed to just condoning an entire ship out of hand. But people get so divisive about this, and I'm probably going to get hate comments about this under this video for not condemning Wincest in the strongest of terms. I just don't read it, and if it bothers you that much, neither do you. AO3 has a pretty solid filtering system in place, you can just avoid it. However, in the early days of the fandom, not everyone wrote Wincest. Some people found the idea of writing about two brothers too objectionable to engage with, so their solution was... It was, okay, I guess I just, ha I just have to say it, don't I? Their solution was to write real person fan fiction about the actors themselves. And I have to be honest, I think writing about two real life people is a lot more morally iffy than writing about two fictional brothers. Especially as the show went on, the fandom and the people behind the show got a lot more enmeshed and a lot more connected. With that in mind, there was a high chance that the actors were going to see these, and I believe they did. I didn't save a link to a source for that, but I'm pretty sure I saw it somewhere. If Editing David can find it later, he will show it. Sam slash Dean. Together. This ship was called J2, as the actors' first names both started with J, Jared and Jansen. The RPF, or Real Person Fan Fiction Community, within the Supernatural fandom is notable for a few reasons. The popular fanfic and Kindle romance trope of Omegaverse, where characters have wolf-like tendencies based on a now-debunked study, um, originated from Supernatural, specifically from an RPF fanfiction. It was specifically written as a response to a prompt from someone on LiveJournal asking for that precise concept. For this prompt, which I'm paraphrasing into, in a world where men are either alpha males or bitches, Jensen is a snotty prude who won't let anybody have his sweet little ass. And he meets alpha male Jared, sort of a human lady in the tramp with dog-like sex. And then the fic begins and it almost immediately goes into territory that will get me kicked off YouTube. This isn't the only notable fanfiction to spawn from the RPF side of the fandom. I'm skipping ahead in the timeline here, but it's relevant and also so crazy I feel like I have to mention it somewhere. In 2010, RPF writer Gator Girl uploaded the fic Caught Between the Earth and Sky to AO3. This was an AU fic where the real-life actor Jensen Ackles was a member of Doctors Without Borders, and it was about him going to Haiti after the earthquake. And things got racist pretty quick. For one thing, people criticized the fact that this was about a very recent and horrific tragedy. Just to quote one particular post about this. Right, so, never mind the actual tragedy that devastated an entire country less than six months ago. Never mind the hundreds of thousands of black people, black children, that died or were hurt, or who lost people they loved, or who lost their homes, or who had their entire lives torn apart. No, what's really important is the romance between these two beautiful white men, and how they learn and grow and become better people because of their condescending to help these noble, gentle black folk. Excuse me while I throw up in my mouth a little. It was bad, like I said. It was already pretty tasteless to begin with as a concept, but then its um, depiction of Haitians was also criticized. There was a lot of descriptions of their skin being like dark chocolate or whatever. A lot of discussion about how they must suffer to endure because that is their lives and oh, it is so tragic. Oh, it's bad. I didn't read this fic in full, but I did copy and paste a quote from it that I'm going to read aloud. I don't condone this. I am just reading it. Want to make that very clear. The slash of white smiles, incongruous gray eyes in a dark face, a collection of half-melted prayer candles sitting in a hardened puddle of colored wax, the brilliant red, white, and blue of the American flag on a little boy's t-shirt. What the fuck is this? In addition to this, I'm also led to believe that the author sprinkled in photos of the actual tragedy within the fic, which, wow, my dude or dudette or whatever the gender-neutral equivalent of those terms is, that's not okay. This fic deserves a video unto itself, I swear. But to be perfectly honest, I feel like someone who writes a lot of real-person fanfiction is gonna have pretty bad boundaries about what's acceptable to write about to begin with when it comes to writing about real-life stuff, because that's kind of their M.O. Anyways, the RPF community remained a huge part of the fandom for the entirety of the show's run, and some people took it even further. Some people became convinced that the actors themselves were actually dating and keeping it secret. I'm going to be perfectly honest here, whenever I see a large group of terminally online people begin to speculate about the sexuality of two men like this and claiming that they have a secret relationship that, like, 
the people who are their managers are forcing them to cover up. I find it really icky and kind of otherizing. People end up becoming insane conspiracy theorists about this kind of thing, and as a queer man myself, I'm just gonna say I find it creepy. Most of the people that doing this are not themselves queer men as well, in my experience, so I'm just kind of side-eyeing their reasons for being so invested in these two people's relationship. Some examples of this insane conspiracy theory included things like the jerseys they wore to a, some sports game or another, having numbers which represented love in Chinese numerology. I could go on. I found an intensely detailed timeline of all the proof of this, and some of it was some of the most tenuous bullcrap I've seen in my entire life. It's stuff like one of them making a rather emasculating joke about the other, about how when he gets scared he has to hold his hand to make him feel better during filming. Or it's like, oh wow, they sure hug a lot. Or, hey, here's the time that one of them tried to kiss the other, clearly as a joke, a homophobic joke, I might add, that is basically sexual harassment, and I'm going to hope that their relationship is in a place that even if they're not together, that kind of thing's okay. I feel like some of these people who really went in hard onto this conspiracy theory didn't really grow up around straight men in the early aughts, because there was a lot of just straight men doing like homoerotic stuff as a joke, as if to prove like how not gay they were, or to make fun of the idea of two men being intimate together. And watching stuff like one of these actors trying to kiss the other, that's the vibe I get. I don't get a romantic vibe. I think it was a way for some people to try and mediate the increasing visibility gay men were getting, but that's just my two cents. Like, it was suddenly making them feel more anxious about the relationships they were having with their own guy friends, and this was just a way to express that anxiety with these, like, no homo actions. I also can't help but feel that if this was in fact true, and if these actors were in a secret relationship that they had to keep quiet for whatever reason, the people who were trying to prove it are actually trying to out them against their will. And that's also really bad. Much like with Louis and Harry from One Direction, I can't help but feel like people need to maybe not invest so much in relationships between real people that aren't in any way actually confirmed. It's creepy. If you think about the Jays in this way, or about Louis and Harry in this way, I think you need to step away from the computer and re-examine your reasons for doing so. Seriously, just Please stop. Anyways, the conspiracy theorist side of the fandom got so big it began to be referred to as tin hatting, and it was so prevalent in the fandom, or at the very least the fandom was super aware of it, that it became kind of a community in-joke. Hee <laughs> hee hee, it's so funny that people are obsessively making up conspiracy theories and projecting our society's harmful ideas about how men should interact onto these two real people to claim that they're gay. Something which, if they ever became aware of, could negatively impact their friendship they seem to genuinely have. Ha <laughs> ha. So funny. Tin Hatting's prevalence was so big that at one of the first big supernatural conventions, making a tin hat, having a contest to prove who had the best tin hat, and having a tin hat gala were all events at the convention. Because the supernatural fandom has always been one thing, and that one thing is fucking deranged. But after a certain point, a new ship became popular in the fandom, one which altered the landscape of fanfiction and shipping communities in it forever. One which you, if you were on the internet in the 2010s and involved in any kind of fandom, regardless of what fandom it was, was almost certainly aware of. In season four of the show, the character of Castiel was introduced, played by the actor Misha Collins. Castiel was an angel sent down from heaven, and he'd soon start third-wheeling with the brothers on their adventures fighting monsters. Also, he dresses like a really scruffy private detective and looks like every other Tumblr sexy man from this period. Just thought I should mention that. Anyhow, after something of a rocky start between the two of them, he and Dean Winchester started developing some kind of a relationship. A relationship which many read as romantic. And the show eventually started kind of leaning into that. How much this was done intentionally at the start is debatable, I suppose. As the first Destiel fic was published the first day Castiel appeared. But as time went on, general consensus is that it did eventually become explicit subtext. And yeah, um, the name of this ship between Dean and Castiel is Destiel, so just keep that in mind. As I've said, I've only seen a handful of episodes from the show, so I can't comment on this from what I've seen, but there were definitely moments that did lean into this, and there's no denying that. According to one of my viewers, after I asked for viewer input into this video, they gave Cain, the biblical Cain, an OC wife. Cain and Dean were parallels. Castiel and the wife came off as parallels. 
Sam just kind of got ignored. <laughs> By the way, the second thing listed in this comment, which just lists a bunch of insane stuff that happened on the show, is Dean kills Hitler after Hitler comes back in someone else's body through magic. This is talked about for a bit in season 10 and then never brought up again, because, like I said, the show A got really weird, and B, every genre of show from, like, the 2010s had to do at least one weird Hitler episode, I guess. I'm looking at you, Doctor Who. Right. Putting Hitler in the cupboard. Anyways, now that the options weren't just shipping two brothers or two real-life people, the fans went wild, and Destiel became quickly the biggest ship of the show, if not the entirety of the internet. This ship would go on to be the first one to hit 100,000 fan works on AO3 in 2021. And there's no arguing with those numbers. Not even Dreary hit that numbers. And Dreary is usually considered the ultimate fandom pairing. There was more proof than what I'm mentioning here. I found a post from someone about how Dean is a virgin at the start of the show and he doesn't have as many love interests as Sam does. I have no clue how consistent that was over the course of the show's run, but this was the case as of a Tumblr post from I think 2019. Supernatural fans, feel free to correct me below in the comments, I suppose. I'm sure I'm missing a lot of stuff. Anyways, the show never fully committed to this, though the production team was definitely aware of fan speculation. It even got shouted out in the show's 200th episode celebration. We do explore the nature of Destiel in Act 2. As I've said, I've no clue if the subtext was initially intentional because the show's creator did leave after its fifth season, but people really picked up and ran with it. And when the fandom moved from Live Journal to Tumblr, it only got bigger. Supernatural was inescapable on that platform, and much of that came from the Destiel shippers. I didn't know or care to know much about this show before I started working on this video, but even I was aware of Destiel. Years ago, I would have known what Destiel was if you went to ask me. There was no way to not know about Destiel, and the funniest thing is, I didn't use Tumblr that much. Seeing as I'm talking about its presence on Tumblr, though, I feel like I should probably talk about the Misha apocalypse for a moment. This was an April Fool's Day in 2013, when users all over the site changed their blogs to include this rather strange image of Misha Collins with this, like, kind of baffled expression on his face. I don't know what emotion he's giving here, but that, that's my read on it at the very least. Regardless, as much as people were really into this ship, there was also a lot of discussion about the show potentially queerbaiting everyone. And I think they were. Like, I, I think that the term queerbaiting gets thrown around a lot, but there's no denying that what was going on here was just good old-fashioned queerbaiting. And there was admittedly a lot of this kind of queerbaiting in the 2010s. It's kind of funny to go back to see how much discourse around queer rep there was and how much it has shifted in the last decade. It's easy to forget what a weird liminal space inclusion of gay characters was in shows not that long ago. A lot of TV, ranging from Merlin, in my opinion, to Once Upon a Time, in some people's opinions, did flirt with the idea of one of their main characters being gay without ever fully committing to it. And this was often a point of contention in fandoms across the board. Nowadays, shows oftentimes have queer romances, even if I think oftentimes they are pretty half-baked. So the discussion around queer rep has shifted a lot, but it's funny to go back and to see just how bad it was at the time, you know? And like, maybe sometimes it was the writers trying to get subtext to the audience because like executives wouldn't let certain things go through textually, but that was definitely not the case in Supernatural. According to at least one interview with Misha Collins, he once said that it was canon at a convention or at least I think he said that because the link to the quote where I'm getting this from was broken on fan lore, but just putting that out there, the show heavily acknowledged it. They did not just play coy. So there's no denying that they were kind of toying with their fans. And I think that's scummy. Of course, if we're going to be talking about queer baiting and Destiel, I should probably talk about that panel shall we say. A fan ended up approaching Jensen Ackles at a con specifically to ask him about the ship, and, well, it might be easier if I just show you the footage. Uh, I love the character having more attention to self-esteem. I'm bisexual, and I've noticed some possible subjects. I need this meal. Don't ruin it for everybody now. I do not mean it as disrespectful at all. Thank you, though. That's good. So I'm going to take a cue to move on. 
This is just scummy. He didn't even let her finish asking the question. And you can hear the audience booing. It, it just feels bad, and apparently she left the room in tears. And this kind of broke Tumblr for a bit. As I said, I wasn't even that active on Tumblr at the time, and even I somehow ended up learning about it via osmosis. I can't help but feel that by this point, the show having leaned so heavily into this pairing, the producer should have been prepared for fans to ask questions about this, and should have prepared the actors as a result to answer them in whatever they wanted best to spin it as. Like, this is just bad PR in addition to just being horrifying. This particular drama was so big, it was the inspiration for a published YA novel which was written by one of the writers of Riverdale. I know what happened at the convention was really awful, but the synopsis for the book feels like someone trying to write a fix-it fic for the event and for, like, the actual people involved, as opposed to anything else. It's really funny to me for that reason. Like, it's not just a story about fandom, it's specifically fanfiction about a specific event that happened in one specific fandom. Claire is a 16-year-old fangirl obsessed with the show Demon Heart. Forrest is an actor in Demon Heart who dreams of bigger roles. When the two meet at a local Comic-Con panel, it's dream come true for Claire, until the Q&A, that is, when Forrest laughs off Claire's assertion that his character is gay. Claire is devastated. After all, every last word of her super popular fanfic revolves around the romance between Forrest's character and his male frenemy. She can't believe her hero turned out to be a closed-minded jerk. Forrest is mostly confused that anyone would think his character is gay because he's not. Definitely not. Because the only reason someone would be homophobic is if they're closeted and gay, apparently. Great, love that. Anyways, unfortunately for Demon Heart, when the video of the disastrous Q&A goes viral, the producers have a PR nightmare on their hands. In order to help bolster their image with the LGBTQ plus community, as well as with their fans, they hire Claire to join the cast for the rest of their publicity tour. What ensues is a series of colorful Comic-Con clashes between fans and the show that led Forrest to question his assumptions about sexuality and help Claire come out of her shell. How far will Claire go to make her ship canon? To what lengths will Forrest go to stop her and protect his career? And will Claire ever get the guts to make a move on Tess, the very cute, extremely cool fan artist she keeps running into? Ship It is a funny, tender, and honest look at all the feels that come with being a fan. I can't believe I just said all the feels. I need to go wash my mouth out. I'll be right back. Okay, where was I? That book just sounds terrible. I'm sorry. If you've read it, let me know what you thought of it. By the way, not only did the writer of this write for Riverdale, she's credited as the co-writer of the episode, which featured the now iconic, in case you haven't noticed, I'm weird, Jughead monologue. In case you haven't noticed, I'm weird. I'm a weirdo. I don't fit in, and I don't want to fit in. Have you ever seen me without this stupid hat on? That's weird. By this point in the show's history, it had gotten pretty enmeshed with the fan base. Writers and producers would sometimes tweet along during episode broadcasts, and there were interviews where the actors acknowledged that they were aware of fan fiction written about the show, and much more. J2, the ship name for the two real-life actors being together, even got name-dropped in an episode, which is really frickin' weird if you ask me. J squared got me good. There was also a character named Amy Pond, a reference to Doctor Who, and to the fact that many Supernatural fans also watched the show. The entire 200th episode was a weird metatextual story about the fan base. I have to be honest with how weird and kind of insane this fandom got, I do pity the people working on it. For example, to quote the extremely detailed SupernaturalWiki.com, in season 10, episode 9, The Things We Left Behind, there's a scene where Sam brings Dean a grilled cheese sandwich. Robbie Thompson made a funny comment about cutting your darlings while he was live tweeting the show, and later, Guy Norman B in a podcast with Winchester Bros mentioned that the scene had been cut in length and originally showed Sam making the sandwich. Fandom expressed outrage over this instance of Sam Erasure, and many were critical of this episode's editor, the ironically named James Pickle. The incident became known as Grilled Cheesegate. Slight correction to the editors of this wiki. That is not how you use ironic. Just putting that out there. Wow, you guys. Just, just wow. Gave an editor trying to do his job shit for cutting down a scene just to make sure that an episode stayed within a certain length. You know, the thing that editors always have to do. There was also the time that this image of Sam became viral because his butt was kind of stuck up in the air, and then someone calculated the curvature of his ass. Can't believe I just said that. And then that number became such a meme unto itself that they had the actor pose with a giant sign with the equation on it during a convention photo event. And it, like, this is weird, you guys. Did he even know what the numbers meant? I'm not sure which is worse, if he did or if he didn't. I know that it's intended as just a 
silly shit post, but you're still commenting on someone's body and it just... I don't like it. I'm sorry. I just personally don't. One much scarier example of how entwined the show and fandom became was what happened with the actor Travis Aaron Wade, though. He played a character in the show's 10th season and began interacting with the fandom online and in person in some pretty terrible ways. Stories about him acting threatening, creepily, and intensely inappropriate towards his fans soon surfaced. It was really sad. It was like a stalking allocation. Just really bad shit all around. On a lighter and slightly less deranged note, the fandom also allowed Misha Collins to organize a really big international event called Gishwis. Gishwis is an acronym for greatest international scavenger hunt the world has ever seen and is another thing which could get an entire video focused on if I wanted to. I'm working on a huge project at the moment. If you read the updates in my community tab, you already know what it is, so I can't devote as much time as I'd like to any of this, but to put this particular thing as simply as possible. Gishwis was this huge endeavor which got coverage from many news sites every year it ran. A list would be posted to the Hunt's website of over 100 tasks and people would sign up to take part. It was played in teams of 15 and you either had to get a group together for your team or let the organizer sign you up to a team of complete strangers. You then had to post proof of the tasks being completed and these tasks were pretty fucking insane. The list would include things like sending in images of the following. Adults and a dog sitting on chairs around a table in a public library. The humans are reading Dr. Seuss books. The dog is wearing prescription eyeglasses and reading Kant. Ever seen the movie The Hangover? Let's see the aftermath of the most debaucherous party ever. Photo must be taken at the home of a team member's parents. Kilt entirely made of sliced cucumbers. Must be worn by a man. I don't have an image of most of these, but I do have one of the cucumber kilt guy because it's on Wikipedia. Just look at him. Look how proud he is. Round of applause for Cucumber Kilt Guy. Shoot an erotically charged scene. The film must involve a pizza man and the actors can only talk about grammar and fonts. Please use at least three of the following terms. Kerning, serif, gerund, participle, and imperfective. Someone got this one done too, believe it or not. Sans serif just isn't enough to satisfy. I like my serifs long and thick. Has anyone ever told you that you have a beautiful typeface? According to Misha Collins, Every task every year was completed by at least one person, unless it was something that was just physically impossible to do. Like one year, a task was to cover a blimp in fall leaves, and no one could do it because, well, the physics of it just did not add up. All of this was done to raise money for a variety of charities, as it cost about $25 to sign up. I think there is something kind of beautiful about this. Even if the show's fandom was kind of nuts, I think this is an example of the good that came out of it. Many people resonated with the story on the show, or made friends through the fandom, and even though I've been really rough on them, that doesn't discount people's personal positive experiences, and I want to make that clear. If you had had a great time in the Supernatural fandom, if you are a Supernatural fan, this is not a personal dig at you. Unless you're a J2 truther. Fuck you. A lot of the fandom's excitement and synergy between the show and themselves culminated in the 200th episode, which I mentioned earlier. I have to be honest, if you're a part of the fandom, let me know what you make of this episode because I find it really odd. So for a bit of context, in the universe of Supernatural, the creator of the show is a character. There's this published author who has these strange prophetic dreams about the brothers' adventures, and he publishes his visions as books, and the show just kind of uses this to make, like, metatextual commentary on itself, which it did well before this particular episode. In this episode, a bunch of girls going to, like, an all-girls boarding school, I think, are performing a musical that they've written about Supernatural, the book series. And one of the Greek muses, who is a Supernatural superfan, is killing people who are trying to shut the performance down because she loves it so much. <laughs> Supernatural has everything. Life, death, resurrection. As I've said, there's an acknowledgement of Dusty Allen here, and there's kind of a nice moment where the brothers acknowledge that the fans of the In Universe book series have a different interpretation of events, and they're okay with that, even if it's not officially canon, which seems like a nod to the fandom and kind of like them being like, we don't understand you, but we think you're cool. But like, I find this meta in a strange way that I'm not sure was intended in addition to that. Like, the plot of this episode celebrating the show's long run is that a crazed fangirl is forcing someone to make content about her favorite series under duress because if she stops, she will die. Which sounds like the writers are exhausted and feel like they're being forced to do this to keep the fans happy. I don't know if that's the intentional reading of this or not, but having the main villain in the 200th episode being someone who is so obsessed with the show they're willing to kill for it, and also one of the Greek muses is such a weird move and I don't know 
if it's supposed to be interpreted in some way or if it's just stupid and silly for the sake of being silly. This is also not the only time the show did something like this. In season five, the character of Becky was introduced, whose entire thing was that she was a super fan of the books, and when she found out that the brothers were real, like, freaked out, and she was kind of nuts. <laughs> Anyhow, the show would continue to chug along year after year, until, come season 15, it was announced that the show would be ending. But that's not the main thing. The main thing is what happened during the 15th season. On November 5th, 2020, the 18th episode of the season aired, and well, let's be real here. If you watch this kind of content, you probably remember this. You were probably online when it happened because it was insanity. To make a long and complicated story short, Castiel told Dean that he loved him for the first time and then vanished because he was sent off to hell. Not just any hell, super mega ultra hell. And then Tumblr and Twitter just exploded. I was on Twitter at the time, and this was trending. And to my memory, a lot of it seemed kind of meme -y. Like, it was people who were clearly fans of the show. They had, like, images of the characters in their profile pictures, but they were just memeing on how dumb and funny this was. It's like the fandom had hit a point where the people who were still clinging on were still very much in on the joke to a degree. Like, they knew that the show was bad, and they'd kind of come to terms with the fact that Destiel was never going to be confirmed. But then this happened, and they were shocked. And for it to happen, and then to have Castiel just die, it's just funny. Like, it's problematic, it's bury your gaze, quite literally, but it's so funny. I love you. Ten seconds later. <laughs> It was impossible to not meme on it. And then Castiel's like not mentioned again for the next few episodes and gets rescued off screen in the finality. And then that became its own shit show as people were positive that the show was going to end with Dean going into hell to rescue Castiel as kind of an echo of how Castiel and Dean first met. Um, I should have mentioned this when I first mentioned Castiel's introduction, but he's introduced as saving Dean from hell after he gets sent to hell, so it would be kind of a nice parallel. But that did not happen. The whole finale situation is such a shit show that could get its own video. Other people have spoken about it. Sarah Zed did a whole video on it. I highly recommend it. Just watch it after this. Get to the end, because we're getting close to the end now. Speaking of the end, with that series finale, Supernatural itself came to an end. Sort of. Kind of. Not really. Because Supernatural is never going to die, and I kind of love that. Not even the show ending has stopped the fandom or the ongoing dramas. For starters, a prequel about Sam and Dean's parents was announced, which was to feature Dean telling the story, with Jensen Ackles returning to reprise the role. Jared Padalecki found out about this show being made supposedly through Twitter, and he tweeted out, Wish I heard about this some way other than Twitter. I'm excited to watch, but bummed that Sam Winchester has no involvement in it whatsoever. This briefly was perceived as him and Jensen Ackles fighting, leading to some fans jokingly calling it the J2 breakup, because the J2 thing just will never die. Padalecki did eventually clarify his feelings. The prequel series debuted in 2022, and nobody fucking liked it. It lasted for one season before it got cancelled, and that was that. There was also a recent convention appearance by the actors where Misha Collins accidentally said he was bisexual, and Tumblr went crazy about that before he again had to clarify. There's also, at time of writing, um, a cruise coming up where you can pay to meet some of the actors which is also getting thoroughly memed on. Overall, Supernatural the show and the fandom alike were a wild ride, and when it comes to the fandom at least, it does not seem to be stopping. I went into this not realizing just how big this fandom was, and was blown away by what I found. Y'all are wild. Oh my gosh. There's a few odds and ends I'd like to mention that I couldn't fit anywhere in this mess of a video, so without further ado, here's five random things about Supernatural I feel like I have to bring up. Number one, Scooby Natural. This was an episode of the main show where uh, Sam and Dean get sucked into an episode of Scooby-Doo and one of them hits on Daphne. It's pretty fun besides that last part. She's like 17, dude. Calm down. Number two, The Wedding. Online, after it became clear that there was never going to be any more Destiel or any kind of, like, wedding or anything like that. Ten celebrated a wedding regardless by posting art and fanfiction about it online, which is just kind of sweet. I think that's nice. Good for you guys. Number three, 
the bagel apocalypse. To quote a Tumblr post about it, the bagel apocalypse can be best described as a stress-induced response that was triggered with the conclusion of seeing Demon wake up as a demon in the season 9 finale. Shortly after, during the helatus of 2014, the fandom collectively underwent some sort of bizarre breakdown, which mostly manifested in bagels being thrown into every fan work that you could think of. Think the Mish Apocalypse, but with slightly more bread. Number four, according to SupernaturalWiki.com, because so many of Sam Winchester's love interests have died, he was coined as having a peen of death by some in the fandom. And finally, number five, the word mansplaining originates from a Tumblr live journal post about Supernatural. And I think in the long run, that post is going to be the show's legacy. <laughs> I usually try to have some kind of thesis to tie all of this together, but I think the only real thesis I can make from all of this is, wow, shit's wild. The show was problematic and the fans were sometimes a little deranged, but it meant a lot to a lot of people and I can see why. After reading up on the show and its lore, I can see that the dynamic between the brothers meant a lot to many. I'm sure not every fan was as crazy as I've made them out to be in this video. And I want to make that very clear. Like, just don't, don't harass me. I'm not, this isn't meant to be like a hit piece. Were you a part of the Supernatural fandom? Do you have a favorite episode? Did you read or write Destiel fanfiction? Let me know. I like hearing from my audience. You likely won't be seeing me until October. Got a huge project I've been working on. I'm a bit worried about it. It should be ready before Halloween. If you've been following along with the community tabs, you already know what it is and I'm really excited for it. If you like shows about monsters and long form videos recapping random TV shows, then you're going to love this. There might be a video out before then, there might not. I'm still working out details, we'll see. But until next time, this is David M signing off.